We bow our knees and hearts unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that you would grant us the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of yourself, that the eyes of our understanding would be enlightened, that we would know the hope of our calling and the exceeding riches of the glorious inheritance within the saints. Unto you be glory in the church throughout all ages, world without end. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. You may be seated. The sermon is entitled, Jesus' Faithfulness to Interrupt the Status Quo. Jesus' Faithfulness to Interrupt the Status Quo. As we go through the gospel lesson for today and thinking about just the ministry and the work of Jesus, we find that he was interrupted all the time. Uh, but Jesus had a way of interrupting the status quo. My relatives on my father's side of the family, uh, our name was originally Rutkowskis. It was not Rut, R-U-T-T. Uh, Rutkowskis was the name. Uh, they came over from Lithuania, basically uh, most of them in the turn of the 20th century. Um, our family's name changed to Rut. It was shortened. I was told as a young boy it was because um, that's what a lot of people did when they came to Ellis Island and then they, our family went to Pennsylvania, then moved to the Chicago area, the south side of Chicago. But as a young boy, every year we would go to the cemetery, sometimes more than once a year, to put uh, flowers on graves. And uh, when Uncle Bruno died, I always wondered why his name went from Rutkowskis to Rutkowski and not to Rut because on his grave is Rutkowski. And so when he died, my father took me to the bank. We went from, to the bank, got these big bags, and he said, son, I was just a little squirt. So he said, when we get to Uncle Bruno's uh, apartment, uh, your job is to collect all the silver dollars. And I collected over 300 silver dollars. Uh, so this is back in the 1950s. Uh, I couldn't carry the bags, they were so heavy. Uh, so I'm thinking, okay, well, what did Uncle Bruno do? However, he did go to Las Vegas at times. Uh, I didn't make connections except stories as time went on. I would ask my father, and he would tell me little bits and pieces. But finally, you know, I went to my grandma. So, uh, grandma. Um, and I have my grandmother's uh, marriage, marriage license. Um, this certifies that uh, she... Uh, Stella Balsas, she came over from Lithuania and she married a Stanley Rutt. Uh, the name already had been changed. Uh, and they were united in holy matrimony uh, at St. David's uh, Roman Catholic Church in the south side of Chicago. Um, and uh, it has all the signatures here and everything. I've tried to keep it preserved. <clears throat> so our family <clears throat> on my father's side of the family, they were, they were Roman Catholics. On my mom's side of the family, they came over from England, and they, were, uh, they settled in Virginia, and they were Anglicans. In fact, uh, on my mother's side, uh, they were members of a church that George Washington's brother was a member of, an Anglican church there. So I didn't grow up in the Anglican tradition, uh, and... Uh, I pretty well stayed away from the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, being brought up in nor northeastern Illinois, my parents went to Moody Bible Institute, and uh, I think uh, you taught in the Chicago area, is that correct? Wheaton College, okay. So I used to go to Wheaton College for meetings as a kid and heard Billy Graham preach at Soldiers Field in Chicago at the age of five. So anyway, we were not Roman Catholics, but um, so, so I'm trying to figure stuff out and my grandma, finally at the age of 21, grandma sat me down and says, and, and I've just been married a few months, she says, okay, son, grandson, you know, Steve, Steve you, can, you can now, well, she called me Stevie, actually. Stevie, I, I, I can tell you some stuff now. I said about Uncle Bruno, yes, yes, and then she prefaced everything. She said, you have to understand the period of time in which we lived. And uh, you had to have protection, and you had to have a certain type of insurance. And uh, okay, so I said, come on, Grandma, just get to the point. Like, who was his boss? Well, you got to realize. And she just kept 
She kept them. <laughs> Some of you have heard this story before, but anyway, it bears repeating. Finally, my grandma said, okay, okay. Al Capone worked for Al Capone. Now you got to realize, and I go, Al Capone. He, go, I get he, he never killed anybody. Bruno told me he never killed anybody. I said, okay, all right. Okay, Grandma, that's good, but like, okay. So I said his name went from Rakowskis to Rakowski and didn't get the rut. And uh, she said, well, he, he uh, you know, our family was involved in the Prohibition days uh, de making deliveries and making our own brews. And uh, I said, oh, okay, yeah, I kind of knew that. Dad told me some stories anyway, long story short. Um, yeah, uh, my dad's side of the family went pretty wild. They went away from the, their Roman Catholic roots um, and just went in a bad direction. So it was necessary for our family to change its na their name. My, my grandmother's next husband, because my, his, her first husband died, her second husband died very strangely, my dad always thought was probably mafia related. Uh, and my grandma did not remarry until later in life she married a Lutheran. So that comes in the Protestant side of Christianity. Um, I brought this here today. Um, it's very meaningful to me. It shows Mary and Joseph here and it shows the high priest on the marriage certificate. It's really uh, quite good. Um, always keep in mind, we don't, we don't know the, the day that um, William Shakespeare was born, but we do know the day he was baptized. The Church of England, as well as the Roman Catholic Churches, they keep good records of things. I found that out when my wife and I lived in, in uh, England. I pastored in Lancashire County. Uh, they keep very good records. Well, my grandmother later in life, when she told me the story, she had already confessed her faith in Christ, and there was a, a turn. The Lord did not give up on our relatives. When, when her mother, my great-grandmother, who was a bootlegger um, and was involved with the mafia, um, she got saved gloriously, and that was through a Pentecostal lady neighbor who never gave up on my great-grandmother. And kept witnessing to her and to shut up my great grandmother, uh, or to shut up, I'm sorry, to shut up the Pentecostal lady, my great grandmother decided to go to church with her. And my, my dad told me the story that when she came home from this Pentecostal church, my great grandmother threw all the men out of the house, emptied all the bottles of alcohol, uh, and just plastered the walls with pictures of Jesus. And she died being a very solid Christian. Uh, from a very wild background. Again, Roman Catholic roots went away, and yet our good shepherd went, left the 99 and went after the lost sheep. And, uh, and I still remember my great-grandmother holding me on her lap, bouncing me as a little kid. I, she died when I was five. And then she would pray over me and then sing. I still remember her singing joyful with a lot of joy. And, and then my dad said, well, she used to pray, and then she'd say in Lithuanian, uh, this is my preacher boy. This is my preacher boy. So, my, so really, um, I had hands laid on me, uh, not by a, a bishop um, in my young age, but by a woman who was a wild uh, gangster uh, who Christ saved. And then when she died, both my grandmother and my aunt uh, became Christians. Why am I telling you that? Well. Because in the gospel lesson today, we've got two females that Jesus was busy doing the work of the kingdom, but he's interrupted by Jairus uh, about his daughter dying and also about the woman uh, with the issue of blood, a woman who needed a hysterectomy uh, and then did, but you know, the way they went about it then, there was 12 years she suffered. Uh, in many ways, my, the women in our family, and my dad's side of the family, uh, one by one became Christians and became solid Christians, uh, which is wonderful. So I, I, when, I, when I read the gospel account in Matthew, and it's also in Mark and Luke, uh, I, I think quite often of the women on my dad's side of the family that one by one Jesus 
left the 99 and went after and brought them back to the fold. They were, they were baptized, so they were uh, covenantally adopted in their baptism, and uh, Jesus did not give up on them. Thank God. Today's prayer, O Lord, we beseech thee, absolve thy people. Absolve thy people. Absolve thy people from their offenses, that through thy bountiful goodness we may all be delivered from the bands of those sins which by our frailty we have committed. Grant this, O Heavenly Father, for the sake of Jesus Christ, our blessed Lord and Savior. Amen. Well, absolution, we have the absolution after the confession of sins, and it, it deals with uh, forgiveness. It also deals with to being cleared from uh, offense and to be released from sin. Uh, the chains fall off, uh, so to speak, in our minds after the confession of sins and the absolution. Now, in the Old Testament lesson, um, Malachi confronts his own people uh, concerning disloyalty. So, in a sense, in Malachi 3, the, the verses that precede the Old Testament lesson for today is dealing with this. Uh, and, the, and I would say that the people of God at that time after the, uh, the exile in Babylon for 70 years of captivity, and now they're back in their land, Malachi is, is prophesying to them and basically absolve thy people from robbing God. They, and then, well, how did we rob God? Well, in the tithes and offerings. And so, just as we saw in the Old Testament lesson a few weeks ago about Zechariah the high priest, he had, uh, not Zechariah the high priest, um, Joshua the high priest, in the book of Zechariah, it made it clear that he and Zerubbabel, uh, representatives of the, the church and the state at that time, had to get their act together. And, of course, Zechariah saw the need for uh, Joshua the high priest to be reclothed with the, pro the proper high priestly garments. That's very important. Because the garment that Jesus was wearing was very important in the gospel lesson for today. But in Malachi 3, they were absolved from robbing God. In this psalm, Psalm 66, um, it says uh, in the King James Version, which I grew up with, um, if any man regards or takes pleasure in iniquity, in lawlessness, if you take pleasure in iniquity, the Lord will not hear you. If you're enjoying the lawlessness. The Lord will not hear you. So in Psalm 66, which is a great uh, psalm of, that we just chanted as in our worship, of, of the, that all throughout the world, the nations of the earth will worship before thee. All the kindreds and tongues and nations shall worship. And so the psalmist is declaring that but he deals specifically that if you, if you regard iniquity in your heart, the Lord will not hear you. So absolve thy people from taking pleasure in lawlessness. Uh, in, in the gospel lesson, two ways of looking at this. Absolve thy people from pharisaical exclusiveness or being elitist. Uh, in Matthew 9, uh, and in particular, uh, verse 11. And absolve thy people from pessimistic laughter for not trusting God the time when, when uh, Jesus said, no, she, she's just sleeping, and then they, the, the ones that were out there crying and, and weeping and making noise, they just started laughing. They basically, in the, in the Greek text, it means they basically laughed in Jesus' face. That's how arrogant they were. They were elitist at that time. And, uh, and then Jesus raised her from the dead. So absolve thy people from robbing God, absolve thy people from taking pleasure in lawlessness, Absolve thy people from pharisaical exclusiveness or elitism, and absolve thy people from pessimistic laughter for not trusting God. Now Malachi confronts his own people's covenant disloyalty, and he ends this prophecy by calling the people back to remember Moses and Elijah. Moses represented the law, and Elijah represented the prophets. Malachi delivers a series of six disputes against God's covenant people. And in this passage, it's, he, the, we read today, it's dealing with um, the fifth and sixth disputes uh, that are being addressed for their injustice expressed by robbing God of the tithe and by their injustice expressing by neglecting the poor. Well, we could go on on the Malachi passage, but I, I want to move on. I've got... Uh, lots of notes here, but I, I just want to bring our 
thoughts to this. What happens when people steal from God? Well, he calls them to repent. Um, the need for absolution. And there is forgiveness. The best way to solve it is just to tithe. <laughs> so, uh, again, my father and mother taught me this, and uh, my father was very, even at times in construction work, because he worked on the skyscrapers in Chicago, but sometimes in the wintertime he'd be out of work. And so things were tied at times, but even when my dad was out of work, he always tied at the Elgin Bible Church where we were members, always. And he, and he budgeted out and he taught me by example, like this is what you do. And you know, I had conversations when I got older with my dad about, yeah, but you know, what happens if you don't have enough money? Dad, you've been out of work. He says, no, 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 son. The, the Lord will always open the windows of heaven. Just watch and see. And I saw that in many different ways growing up. And my dad's faith was very strong in that regard. And um, let's get to the gospel, though. The gospel lesson for the 24th Sunday after Trinity begins with Jesus' willingness to remain in Matthew's house. In the context of what's going on there, he's in Matthew's house, who was a tax collector. People, the Jews, did not like him at all. Uh, he would stick it to them financially, kind of like an IRS agent uh, today. Um, but even though the Pharisees, after giving Jesus flack for hanging out and eating a meal with tax collectors and sinners in verse 11 of Matthew 9, we see that Jesus is not distracted. He's not He's not interrupted from his course of kingdom teaching in spite of all the accusations. Accusations come against us, and sometimes we then divert and we move away from what we've been uh, doing in terms of kingdom work, uh, quite often because of, of fear or just we're just tired of the, the flack that's coming our way. Jesus was not uh, moved in that kind of way. He was moved with compassion to deal with people, but occasionally he let them know. And, and Jesus had a great sense of humor. I am convinced of that. The more I read the scriptures, it, you know, and calling them, uh, woe to you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites. Uh, and then he would, you're like whitewashed walls. He goes through a whole list of things. He, he went against the status quo of the day because they had, even in the area of tithing, uh, the, Jesus confronted them, Matthew 23, 23. You, you, you're very faithful to give the, the tithes of the mint, anise, and cumin, but when it comes to the weightier matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faith, or faithfulness, you've forgotten those. And that's what the law is all about. Justice, faith, and mercy. And he says, the other things you should have done. So Jesus doesn't dis tithing. When I hear people saying, well, it's not in the New Testament. Well, it is in the New Testament. Uh, and, and God loves a cheerful giver, by the way. All right. Um, so Jesus was not distracted by the interruptions that came his way and law, as far as losing track of where he was going. But it mentions that John's disciples are here, the disciples of John the Baptist at Matthew's house, which was located in his hometown of Capernaum where Jesus had set up his headquarters for ministry. And a certain Jairus came to Jesus in desperation about his daughter's death. And when he approached Jesus, interestingly, this elder, he's, and again, he's, he's a, a main elder in the synagogue, he worships our Lord. He, he, he worships the Lord immediately. Well, who was this Jairus? Why did he worship Jesus? Well, let's draw our attention to these questions. Well, first of all, Jairus was a well-respected ruler in the local synagogue in Capernaum, where Jesus had set up his kingdom headquarters. In fact, he wasn't just one of the elders in Capernaum. He was the president of the, of the synagogue. So he's, he's the main guy there. That meant his word was weighty in local matters. Now, he would have had some opinion of this Jesus who had taken up ministry in his city. Well, think about it. The local synagogue rulers sitting around uh, 
maybe at the local Jewish pub, eating fish bagels and drinking some vintage wine and chatting about this Jesus who had been healing various people in their local area and possibly some of the members of that synagogue. So this Jesus is very important. Jairus goes to him because he's desperate. My daughter has died. Well, somehow Jairus recognized that Jesus was the prophet sent from God. Where we see that he worshiped Jesus. Now, this worship could basically be the typical Eastern form of kneeling before a person of importance as protocol. And yet this president of the synagogue would not set aside his public belief and practice on some whim of a moment. He must have thought through who Jesus was. Well, secondly, Matthew's version of this event points us to realize that the, this ruler's eyes were open to expect a miracle from Jesus' hand. Otherwise, he wouldn't have shown up there. Now, he worships Jesus, and then he asks Jesus to lay hands on his daughter. That's very important. So in, the, uh, in our prayer book, the translation there, it says, while Jesus, or I'm sorry, while Jairus was, ta was <clears throat> taking Jesus to his house, Jesus was interrupted, and he stopped and said to the woman who had suffered with this continuous hemorrhaging, hemorrhaging for 12 years, and he says, take heart, daughter, your faith has made you well. This woman was ceremonially unclean. The law of God, Leviticus 19, says this. If a woman has a discharge of blood for many days, other than at the time of her customary impurity, or if it runs beyond her usual time of impurity, all the days of her unclean discharge shall be as the days of her customary impurity. She shall be unclean. The woman was unclean. And then it goes and it gives the details. Anything she touches, sits on, that's all considered unclean. And then whoever touches those things shall also be unclean, and he shall wash his clothes and bathe in water and be unclean until evening. This is the woman that presses through the crowd. Well, she suffered with this. And we see in the other gospel accounts that every doctor she went to, she didn't get the results. She went to the regular practicing uh, physicians. She eventually probably went to a holistic approach, um, you know, naturopath doctor. Just, that she went, she covered all grounds to find some level of healing, but found none. But we see an interesting thing happening here. St. Mark reports that she suffered from much doctors. Dr. Luke said that she could not be healed by any of them because of being ceremonially unclean. But she said, if I can touch the hem of his garment, the tassel, and this is the, this is the customary garment that men would wear uh, over their other clothing, and it um, had four corners. And on the, the bottom of the corners, it had tassels, uh, not necessarily like this, but they little tassels. And those tassels were reminders of the law of God. Now, think about it. She knows that she's ceremonially unclean. And she knows that that tassel represents the law of God. But somehow, she understood the essence of the law, what St. Paul says in Romans 7, verse 12. The law is holy, and the commandment is holy and just and good. She pressed through the crowd, knowing full well that anybody she touches, they're going to be unclean. But she so believed that if she touched the hem of his garment, that she would be healed. She somehow saw that the law of God is good. That yes, as John Calvin says, the law of God pinches us awake so that we may, be, that we may go to Christ. But the law is purposeful to pinch us awake. 
she was pinched awake because nothing worked in her life. But then Jesus was there. She touched him. And he made her whole. My grandmother, my grandmother, God bless her, the last few years of her life, my parents and uh, my sister and I, we took care of her. Then we got married, so then we moved out, but my parents took care of my grandmother. My grandmother was, was always crying when she heard this song. He touched me. Oh, he touched me. And oh, the joy that floods my soul. Something happened, and now I know he touched me and made me whole. My, my grandmother always cried. Why? Because Jesus touched her, brought her out of depravity, brought her back into the fold. The, the first funeral that I officiate, well, I didn't fully officiate because I wasn't ordained yet, but I preached my grandmother's funeral, and we sang that song. Because my grandmother left this life going, Jesus left it all. He was interrupted in spite of my bad past. And listen, Grandma didn't want to tell me why her name was changed. She sometimes would say, we, uh, we had a lot of family members in trouble with the law. Okay. But see, she came to the faith. <clears throat> this woman was desperate. It appears that after she tried everything to get better and remained in the same condi condition that she threw herself on the mercy of the heavenly court and she understood that the law of God exposed her sin, but she knew that she had to touch that tassel of his garment. This act of faith rested on the mercy and holiness of God who she believed in. Therefore, she desperately interrupted Jesus, and he healed her. Bishop J.C. Ryle comments on this passage by saying, If we may not touch his cloak, we can touch his heart. Such faith saves the soul. Weak faith is less strengthening than strong faith. Weak faith will carry us to heaven with far less joy than full assurance. But weak faith gives an interest in Christ as sure as strong faith. The person who only touches the edge of Christ's cloak will never perish. Amen? Amen. Yes. We will not perish. The acts of desperation in the lives of these two females illustrate for us the sense of our own interruptive desper desperation that is displayed as we approach our Lord in times of major need. The cries of our desperate prayer, if only I may touch the hem of his garment, I shall be made whole, reinforces our utter dependence with seemingly mustard seed faith after suffering through years of agony. This is the devotional application of today's collect, that being the bands of those sins which by our frailty we have committed, points us to the reality of two things, the bondage of sin that emerges spiritually, and secondly, as John Blunt calls it, the physical evils which bind us around with chains that are forged by sin. In times of desperation, we do all sorts of things. Well, Jesus' faithfulness to interrupt the status quo, we will sing uh, uh, the recessional hymn today, my chains fell off, my heart was free. I rose, went forth, and followed thee. That's coming. During times of desperation, we do all sorts of, sorts of things. And we quite often, under times of persecution, Christians with differing views will join together. I've done a lot of ministry in Eastern Europe after the collapse of the Soviet Union working with uh, new church plants and working uh, teaching a Bible college, a Bible college in Lithuania and then uh, preaching throughout um, uh, Poland, Lithuania, Latvia, and uh, the Czech Republic. 
And what I found was they, the hearing the stories of the pastors that endured and survived, many of their friends didn't. Many were persecuted and were martyred for their faith. But those that did survive, they talked about the Baptists and the Roman Catholics and the Pentecostals viewing themselves as one church. They all loved Jesus, and they stood together. Three, three years ago, um, <clears throat> there was an election. Many of us believe it was a stolen election. People have differences of opinion. But um, a guy that I watch online at times um, is a Roman Catholic, former Anglican minister, uh, Episcopal priest, formerly, and but he came, became a Roman Catholic. Um, and uh, he put out, he says, let's, let's go to every state capital and pray. Let's just pray and do a Jericho march seven times around the, the state capital and do it at noon in your own state. So I immediately, as uh, this Taylor Marshall, yes, we know him, Taylor Marshall. Um, I said, yeah. So I show up there with my collar. Usually I'm the only one with a collar there. It's quite often I was the only minister there. But a lot of lay people, a lot of people praying together, well, because I got the collar on, it, it was the local Roman Catholics here in the city of Phoenix that uh, organized the whole thing. They said, Father, would you, would you please lead us in prayer? So, psh, yeah. So I've had a, a Roman Catholic congregation for a while. <laughs> you didn't know that about me. <clears throat> no, it's, uh, but I, I hung out with them. And here's all these people with American flags, Bibles, prayer books, and rosary beads. Oh, well, they're right. What are you doing with the rosary beads? You know, Anglicans have their own rosary beads. You know that um, because uh, many of us Anglicans, uh, we won't say certain prayers that are normally done by the Roman Catholics. I won't go there. I'm just making a point. I saw a lot of little kids, families with five, six, what was it, eight kids, nine kids, and the, most of them, a lot of them from, from countries where they have been persecuted. But they, they knew how to pray, and they knew how to pray with Christians. You know, so the Catholics there, they always, they looked at me, and, hey, we need our Episcopal priest here to kind of lead in prayer, start off the whole thing. So I would do a precatory prayers from the Psalms. We did all sorts of things, you know, that was good. But a lot of these little kids, they got an American flag in one hand and rosary beads in the other. So whatever you view on that is, all I can say is, I did the Via Media. The Roman Catholics were out in the forefront. They were doing Hail Marys, and it wasn't on a football field. But they, they were doing Hail Marys and, and various other prayers. Um, a lot of evangelicals that showed up kind of were in the back. They didn't want to be associated with Roman Catholics. I was smack in the middle. Right, smack in the middle. Why? Because we believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. These are our brethren. And we, we, we seek to maintain the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. Joni, you've been having some good teachings on this. Um, there's a lot of tribalism in the church. And we need to learn how to get along with one another. Now, all I'll say is, I can hang out with my Roman Catholic Christian friends and love them, even though I don't agree with them on various things, especially when it comes to the Lord's table. As Anglicans, we believe in real presence, but real spiritual presence, not physical presence. So we have differences of views, but we still believe, like Calvin, in real spiritual presence of Christ. Our reformers placed this prayer at the end of what is called ordinary time in our Trinity season before we come to Advent so that we can recognize how much we have left undone of those things which we ought to have done and that we have done those things which we ought not to have done and there's no health in us. So as we approach a new season, we will say Happy New Year in a few weeks. It's going to be a new church calendar year. And a lot of glorious things that we are anticipating. 
we want to expect great things from God and to attempt great things for God. So we seek to desperately interrupt Jesus with our cry for help, for deliverance, for healing. So for this cause, he brought her forward. And even, even in the case where he finally gets to the house and your daughter is dead, the man kind of knew that anyway. Jairus knew that. But as he got there and he said, she just is sleeping. And they laughed at him in his face. But Jesus was not diverted by that. He went on the mission. He was on a mission for God the Father. And he did, and he healed the young girl. So we have in that account in the gospel two beautiful stories of two women, a young girl and an older lady that had just been frustrated with everything. And in spite of Jesus' busy schedule, those interruptions that came, in the midst of being in Matthew's house, doing things of the kingdom, his seminar was interrupted because he had kingdom ministry to do with those that were hurting. These two females received life from Jesus because faith was given as a gift from God to desperately interrupt Jesus, his busy schedule. Christmas season, when you watch Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol, remember the words of Jacob Marley described how his sinful actions, he said, before he was, we would say, redeemed, he came on the right side, he said, the links of the chain we have wrought in life. The links of the chain we have wrought in this life. Those chains hold our thoughts down suppress us, we beat ourselves up, but we need to be like these two women, this young girl whose father stood in her place and went to Jesus in spite of the peer pressure he would have been under as the, the chief person of the, the local synagogue. He could care less about his, his reputation. My daughter is, needs a touch from Jesus. Just touch her. Please heal her. And the woman with the issue of blood likewise, driven by, the, by her desire, in spite of what the law said, I believe she really came to understand the law that day, that the law is good. And I'm going to, this man is the lawgiver. I'm going to touch the hem of his garment. And when she did touch the tassel of his garment, she was healed. Let us pray. Father God, I thank you for these scriptures today that, Show us so much about the, your ministry and the way that you were constantly on call and interrupted with all sorts of things, and yet you made these two females, this young girl and this woman, uh, the center of your attention, and the chains were broken, and they were healed. May we be healed as we come to your table today, as we partake and as we do the great thanksgiving. May we also set aside every weight that holds us down, and may we boldly come to your throne of grace to obtain your mercy to help us in the time of need. Amen.